Hello, sophomores. I hope you guys have had a beautiful week. Last week was kind of a challenging one. Because <coughs> we were talking about um, Jesus as and, and his proclamation of the kingdom of God. And that's such a large topic that I condensed pretty heavy. And I realized it was probably not the most fun video ever. But nonetheless, it's an important topic for us to go through. And now we start to kind of move into... Probably some of the most important stuff to understand about Jesus. All right. So the first thing I want you to get is this idea of the kingdom. Now, Jesus's kingdom, as, as we mentioned last week, is this kingdom that is based on uh, um, based on our relationship to him as the king. Right. That it's a real kingdom. That it's a kingdom uh, that, that, that it's, it's an actual nation. But it, it's it's kind of hidden in the world. Right, in that it's it's there's a personal relation and there's a communal relation to Jesus, but that Jesus is not like a governing authority, um, in the traditional sense in this world. He is in the next, but not in this one. So as such, it's like we're submitting to a kingdom that we know we're going to be a part of. We're submitting to a constitution, to a way of being that we know we're going to be a part of, but aren't yet. Now there's a problem here. And the problem is this. You see, this kingdom of God that Jesus is proclaiming is not at all in any way, shape, or form what the Jews were expecting. They were expecting an earthly kingdom. They were expecting a kingdom like the kingdom of David of old, where they would have a nation, but even better, because this nation would eventually rule, the world. would take over um, in, in a large way, you know, that they would be the light to the nations, right? And that slowly but surely, they would become the great ones of the world. They were going to be the next Romans in their mindset, and God was going to do this for them. But Jesus' kingdom isn't like that at all. You see, when they were thinking about the Messiah, they were thinking of the person that was going to bring in this kingdom. And that means by nature that he must be a king. And a king, not in some spiritual sense, but like a regular old king with a crown and, and like who's going to rule the world and rule the kingdom and bring peace and be the guy. Basically, they were going to win the government lottery, right? And be born into this uh, uh, incredibly powerful kingdom that was going to be great. Now, what, what comes along with the kingdom? Well, everything that comes along with the kingdom. For example, armies. They figured the king, like every king, would be the lord of armies, right? That he would have big armies and that he would, he would, he would take over the other countries around him and submit them to his rule, right? They, what else is there? Administration. Right? All sorts of people who are who are government officials, that this was all gonna be some perfectly smooth machine. They were imagining a utopia. They were imagining a place where this king was gonna be just and kind and, and powerful and be God's own chosen one, but it was also gonna be a man of the world and powerful and going to uh, uh, reshape and remake all of creation. Obviously, Looking back on this, we realize that this is a totally silly idea. Um, the problem is, and I think you can see this in any governmental system anywhere in the world, is that power has a tendency to draw out the greed in people, right? The power has a tendency to bring the, pow the people who love power to the top. It's the nature of things. And that's one of the great things about the American government is that it's designed in some way to mitigate that ability, right? Um, through through our through the democratic process. But even still, when we look at our own politicians, we can't help but notice that there's a lot of desire for power and that there's a lot of desire for 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 self-aggrandizement. But it's a lot of people are there for selfish motives. You know, it's um it's no secret that a lot of people go into Congress poor and come out rich. And we all wonder about that a little bit, right? And that's in, that's in a democratic country. Imagine in a, a country that has a king or a dictator or a ruler. It's very, very easy for that to become a tyrant. Yeah? 
but they are imagining that somehow this guy is going to be different from everybody else. That the guy whose God's going to send is going to be this great Messiah who's going to be able to conquer and take over the world. And instead of bringing war and greed and hatred and all, he's going to bring peace and love. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, not a chance. And what Jesus, so when Jesus does show up, He's not what they're expecting. They're expecting a king. They're expecting somebody who's going to really overthrow stuff. And Jesus is not that guy. In fact, he is flat out not that guy. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus is very quiet about his identity. Because he knows that the people have a different expectation. and That that expectation is going to get in the way of what he actually is trying to do in the world. Jesus is trying to actually bring something real into the world, bring the actual kingdom of God, of which God planned from the beginning, bring the actual scriptures that he wrote into, into being. But people, the thing that's going to get in the way is people's misunderstandings of those, that they have a preconceived notion, that they have a prejudice, and their prejudices are going to get in the way of the thing he's trying to do. Right? So... Um, What's, going to, what's this kingdom going to be like? Well, we talked a bit about that last week, that this kingdom is going to be spiritual, that it's going to be a question of my own alignment to God, but not just as a person individually, but as a people. And so what Jesus is doing during his ministry, during his, 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 his public life, is he's building up this very community. He's starting to build up this, this kingdom before anybody knows what's really going on. I'm not saying he's being subversive, but he's being subversive. <laughs> he, he's, he's being kind of, I'm not, he's not trying to be sneaky, but he's, he's, he's not being public. And the first thing he does is he chooses these individual apostles, these 12 apostles. He's going to handle them differently than everybody else, right? They're going to be the core. They're going to get all the information that's needed. They're going to be the ones that are going to be able to disseminate this once the cat's out of the bag, right? And so he brings them together, and what does he do? He has them eat with him, walk with them, sleep with them. Um, that the, he's, he's, he, he hears every word. He explains his every parable. The, he holds nothing back from them. He lets them know everything, right? And he's totally training them along each step of the way. Now, as they're coming along, they're kind of learning what's going on because they didn't like know everything ahead of time. They're really simple guys. But Jesus is kind of carefully goading them and bringing them to the point where they're going to be ready to take over this kingdom, right? Because he knows how this is going to end. Um, at some point, Jesus simply becomes too loud not to notice. And it's not because Jesus is trying to be loud. It's because Jesus can't help but be Jesus. And when you're doing miracles that are bringing people back to life, when you're doing miracles that are healing people from leprosy, and when you're doing miracles that, that are, are, are allowing paralyzed people to walk and the blind to see, you're going to grab some notice. And so people start crowding around Jesus. I mean, they crowd around him a lot, like by the thousands. Like everywhere he goes, there are thousands and thousands of people following him along. This is a problem, a huge problem. Because now, this is a lot more ears listening to what Jesus has to say. They come for what he does, but they stay because of what he says. And now, suddenly, all of those religious leaders throughout the country who are kind of have their ears open for when people start to preach, because, you know, um, we, you know, they have the authority to make sure that the teaching is correct, done correctly. And you have this rogue teacher who's teaching on his own, you bet they're going to come and listen. They're going to come in here. They're going to ask some questions. The first question they're going to ask is, is this person from God or not? And then they're going to ask another question. Is this person, if this person is from God, that's great. If this person is not, well, what kind of teaching is he teaching? Is it in line with God? Because if so, that's fine. That's like any rabbi or any scribe or any Pharisee or any Sadducee. They, 
They're respected people who study the scripture and, and, and try and follow it as best they can. If that's what he's doing, that's fine. But that's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is radical. Jesus is saying things that are really railing. He's saying things like, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, if you are even angry with your brother unjustly, that, you're, that you bear the same punishment. Well, wait a minute. You have heard it said? Well, who said that? God said that. So Jesus is adding on to what God said? That's a big problem for somebody who sits around and spends their whole life studying what God says. So they start asking him, well, are you from God? Are you, are you like giving us new information? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one? And they, of course, don't believe that he is the one, right? Because he's not a king. He doesn't have any armies. He doesn't look like a messiah, right? He doesn't look like the guy who's going to, 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 to rule the country and be a world power. He's just some itinerant preacher out in, the, out in the desert that people are flocking around, right? Not what they're expecting. So, Jesus, he, he keeps it close to the chest. He doesn't say. He, he corrects. And he nails stuff out when it's wrong, and he calls people out, and he does all that, but he doesn't say who he is until he finally, until finally the, 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 he comes to the apostles. They're in a place called Caesarea Philippi, and, they, and he asks his apostles, who do they say that I am? What do they think of me? Who do they think I am? And the bosses say, well, gosh, there's a lot of opinions. Some think you're a great teacher, the greatest rabbi maybe ever. Um, some think you're Elijah, like you're a prophet, come from God. And he looks at him and he says, but who do you, who have lived and breathed with me, who have seen my every move, who have heard my every word, who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? What do you think about me? And St. Peter stands up and he says, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ. And Jesus says, I am. And heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't come up with this on your own. God put this into your heart for you to know. You're right, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. And then he began to tell them what this is going to mean. He began to tell them that this is, this is, this is not the way. It's going to play out differently than it's been played out in history. It's going to be played out differently than the rabbis think it's going to be played out. And he starts to tell them about his crucifixion. He starts to tell them about how he's going to die. And what that's going to mean. And the apostles are flabbergasted. They're shocked. Because for them, they have the same opinion as everybody else. They're expecting him to become the king. They're expecting that he's going to rule the world. And instead, he's telling them that he's going to die a terrible, horrible death. And Peter, the same guy, the same guy who just a minute ago said, I think you're the Messiah, says, no, you can't do that. You, you can't do, no. And Jesus rebukes him on the spot. He says, get behind me. You are thinking as evil thinks, not as God thinks. And that this kingdom is going to be something different than you think it's going to be. That it's not going to be an earthly kingdom. And I already have my army. It's you. You are my army. And you will not fight with swords. You will fight with peace and with death, that you will all die for the faith. This, this is how we will win. We will win through the ways of God, not through the ways of men. This is something totally different. I just don't think, I don't think we can get this. I don't think we can understand just how unexpected Jesus is, that he is the exact opposite of what anyone wanted or anyone thought would happen. 
No one in their right mind thought that this was the way this was going to play out. And yet Jesus is Jesus comes down and is 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 something so compelling and so enigmatic that it's hard to not recognize who he is. It's hard not to recognize just that something massive is going on, that God is moving in the world. And yet, the fact that it's not the way that one would expect is a real problem. It escalates. More and more comes on. Jesus keeps acting. He keeps doing. He keeps doing all the things that he's been doing. And so as he's doing these things, more and more people are coming. At one point, he's healing blind people in front of everyone. At the end, he actually comes, and he's close to Jerusalem, a place called Bethany. And he brings someone back from the dead who's been dead for days. Not somebody who just died and he brought him, you know, like that, that, that almost feels like a resuscitation. This guy's been buried. And Jesus comes and he brings him back to life. And this makes the whole countryside go nuts. They're like, everybody was standing around watching this. And this man comes out of the tomb, still covered in his burial cloths. Like they were scared to open the grave because they knew that he would stink, that his flesh would already be rotting, and Jesus brought him back to life. So when he came to Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, the whole of the town came out and were waving branches in the air, celebrating that the king was coming. They, they knew at this point, that something was going on, and they were ready to crown him king so that he could rule. <coughs> instead, he went to the temple. And there, in the temple, instead of respecting all of those people who work in the temple, he walked in the temple, he made a whip, and he started whipping people out of the temple who didn't belong there. People who were money, changing money. People who were, who were, who were blocking people's passage into to, to, to come and spend time to pray. He was, he was, he came in instead of being friend to the people who ran the temple, he came in like he owned the place and he was cleaning house. And they, they were just was wildly unrespectful to them. For them, this was, this was beyond the ability of, of now there were so many people, they were scared to do anything. So they left him alone. But in the middle of the night, they came and they found him and they caught him and they dragged him back to the temple, back to listen to what the, what the temple authorities had to say. This, these authorities were called the Sanhedrin. And there in front of the Sanhedrin, all the Sanhedrin was sitting there. They looked at him and said, how dare you? Who do you think you are? And they were ready to just throw him in jail. And they tried to bring a bunch of people to talk bad about him, to prove that he did something wrong, but they couldn't. Everybody, everybody who accused him conflicted. It was just a mess. And finally, they just looked at him straight on and said, look, we've heard it said that you think that you are the Messiah. We've heard, we've heard you even say, I even don't want to say these words, that you are the son of God. Do you really think you're God? And Jesus turns to them and he says, I am. I am. I am exactly who, you, who I said I was. I am God himself. And I here stand before you. And today you will see me lifted up. At this point, the whole place goes into a riot. The whole place is, just goes ballistic. And they start beating the, they start beating him up. They start they they drag him to to the king, telling him to, we want this person you know killed. They drag him to the to the governor. I mean, all sorts of things are happening. At this point, Jesus' fate is sealed. They're going to kill him unless he performs a miracle um, for himself. But that's the one thing Jesus won't do. Jesus won't perform a miracle. For himself. He'll do it for everybody else, but not for himself. Because what he's going through in his life, this little life that his father has given him to be human for this short period of time, 
Jesus spends this time being completely obedient to his Father's will. And from here on out, things are going to get very interesting, very fast. I hope God bless you. I hope, you, I hope this week is a wonderful week for you. I look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, God bless.